seven with Walker Bueller. We're going to talk Bobby Miller. We're going to talk Ellie De La Cruz, and we're going to talk curveballs. I've got a really good video, man, and I, I think I kind of chef this one up. It's going to be elite. Like New bourbon, but before we get to the bourbon, we learned something about you a couple weeks ago. Kay. You're a big shoe guy. Yeah. How did that start? Because I know Arm was a big shoe guy, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I don't know. I mean, we've kind of talked through my bourbon stuff and, and all of that. I, I think collecting certain things that are hard to get is something that I've kind of fallen in love with forever. I, I never really, you know what? I had one baseball card growing up. One of my mom's family friends was a big collector and he gave me a baseball card and we moved houses and I lost it in the move. So I think that soured me to baseball cards and I think I've moved on to, to bourbon and shoes, but, um, no, obviously being a, a Nike athlete for my whole career has been uh, was kind of one of those dream dream come true deals. But um, yeah, they they take pretty good care of me. I, I never noticed. It, uh, now now I'm going to start looking out for it. W were you ever a uh, basketball shoes into cleats kind of guy, or is it hard as a pitcher? Like, or do those not play the same way? Yeah. So my rookie year, I wore a pair. Of, well, my first September, and then a lot of my rookie year, I wore a pair of Kyrie's that were made into cleats and. Um, I just ID'd them and, and wore the same pair every year, but or all year. Um, but then, you know, I had a good year in LA and, and re up my Nike deal. And, and luckily, you know, fortunately, they gave me what's called an SMU. So I got a special makeup. So um, next time I'm in Lexington, we can run through them all. But I get to design my own two pairs of cleats every year, which is about as cool as it gets. Oh, that, that is absolutely unreal. Yeah. <laughs> what's on your checklist when, when you're designing your cleats? Like, Obviously, they need to look sick, but but what goes into them? High tops? Um, yeah, I've worn high tops this year. Actually, I, I made a I made two pairs of low tops. I'd never done it before, but um, yeah, I typically wear high tops. What I'll do is I'll just all year I kind of save stuff on StockX or Goat or whatever. Usually Goat um, and kind of inspirational stuff of of what I want to try and do. And um, a lot of times it comes out of stuff that's not even like our colors. So I'll just try and figure out what I can make kind of a Dodger version of or an on-field version of. And and then I have a really good buddy who's huge in the shoe deal. They call him a shoe surgeon. Um, I usually will send him like four or five different ideas and he'll mock them up for me. And, and then I send him a Nike and, and we figure it out. That's so sick. All right. What are we drinking? Is there anyone tonight? else? Oh, yeah. Go for it. Sorry, I was lagging on my end a no, little no, bit. No. I was going to ask if there's anyone else on the uh... – on the Dodgers with uh, a comparable shoe game that, that you can think of or that you know uh, about. Yeah, there's some guy. Jock Peterson was big into it. Um, ah, kind of always went back, guess, forth, back and forth. Trace Thompson does a pretty good job. He's a little more um, selective. I, I think his whole family being basketball players, they, they have a lot of shoes going on <laughs> over there. But, um, no, Trace and I talk through it a lot. And then Austin Barnes tries a little bit but he wears my cleats which is like the coolest thing ever when i throw it to him we have the same cleats on so we're just the only ones that wear a size 10 <laughs> i love that so a clay thompson doesn't supply trace with some antas or anything you haven't seen an they, don't have, uh, they don't have anti baseball cleats yet i'm i'm surprised hey we we just found a niche that, that trace <laughs> needs to go after all right what are we drinking well this week we went with bell mead it's a sour mash from nashville actually so kind of my second home. Um, sour mashes are a little different. I'm going to botch exactly how so I can read on the back, see if it tells us. Uh, but no, the, the sour mash refers to they kind of use the, you know, all the shit that they put in there to make the bourbon the first time. They reintroduce it later, if I'm not mistaken, and kind of re-ferment it a little bit. And it just comes out a little bit, a little bit different. Um, this is probably my favorite sour mash one. They're typically not my favorite, but you know, as we're going on this show, I'm trying to you know show you guys around the world of bourbon. So uh, this is a good one, and, and from Nashville. So sour. Something about the word sour when it comes to alcohol always kind of just makes me a little nervous. Yeah, but I think, it's, it's not I think really it like refers, a sour. It, it refers to like it's been used, right? So like it's been used, so it's now sour because it's fermented. Used used drink doesn't make me feel much better either. I know, I know what you're saying, but it's like, uh, like, can you explain? That? I am such a novice. Think of it, it, uh, it goes through the process multiple times. Is that yeah? So kind of think of it like a sourdough bread where they use like a starter. Yeah, that makes sense. Gotcha. So it kind of accelerates the mash 
and makes it it changes the flavor of it a little bit like they'll take it they'll they'll make a whole you know thing of bourbon and then they'll take it and put it in the new one so it kind of gets the fermenting going a little bit better i think is my understanding okay so now that the first sips down we can talk about the freak show in cincinnati i'm sure you're watching ellie wow. de la cruz highlights i'm Crazy. watching ellie de la cruz highlights when you watch that guy what goes through your mind you know what's funny about it? I think if we would, if he would have debuted two years ago, we would have said we've never seen anything like it. Um, but the shortstop in Pittsburgh is is about as close as as you can get. And it's funny because I I played with I didn't play with him, but I was around when O'Neill Cruz was a Dodger. Yeah, yeah. So I've seen that. I've seen that thing in person, and uh, he's O'Neill is an incredible player and incredibly talented. But this the LA kid seems he's just got a little more. Um, polish to him already on on top of all these tools and um yeah it's it's pretty special to watch it's good so that's the thing jumping in real quick about o'neill um being in indy i got o'neill cruz for two months last year yeah. like i was watching this guy on a day-to-day -day basis and the highlights are awesome the highlights are something that every baseball fan every non-baseball fan can get behind but it's what you see on a daily basis and, and how the six to three put out looks so freaking cool, dude. Yeah. I mean, it, it's everything that cut of human being does that is just exceptional. Yeah. And, and you're probably captivated by it when you're watching. Yeah. I mean, there's certain players, obviously, you know, the Latin players seem to have a kind of a flair or um, a kind of a little different fun to the way they play. But, you know, I play with some guys that, that make those normal plays look really cool. Machado is one of those guys. And even Corey Seager to me was one of those guys that the simplicity in which, you know, he made high level plays is something that um, I think as a, as a player, you, you learn to really uh, grow in love, right? Like it's, it's easy to watch the Jeter play and the jump throw and all that. But I think as a player for me, having a guy on my team, like, how simple can you make the hard plays is, is probably the biggest barrier for uh, how much we trust the ball in your hand. And um, De La Cruz seems to have that at a pretty young age. You watch, you know, young guys can always make the highlight plays and athletic and young and every plays live or die. But, uh, you know, even the plays the first couple of days, he missed the first ball to him. And then after that, it was kind of smooth sailing. And I know he's got like a 98 mile an hour arm or whatever. And, and I did see, you know, his first like four throws were all 88. So there's some sort of tempering the gas pedal that he has at 20 years old or whatever he is. That's, that's pretty special. So as someone that's, you played obviously at a high level in college against a lot of great competition there. And then you get to pro ball where I feel like it's just endless. The amount of talent, it feels like you can just continue whenever I'm able to get out to a minor league ballpark. I feel like I always catch somebody. And I'm like, wow, didn't know that guy was that good. And mm -hmm. I think Ellie De La Cruz and O'Neill Cruz are excellent examples of that because Ellie De La Cruz signs for $65,000. Yep. Most people weren't really paying attention to him in the first couple of years of his professional career. O'Neill Cruz, as Dodgers fans do not like to be reminded of, was kind of traded in a smaller, don't even worry about it type of deal and blossomed into what we now see today. How, how often do you feel like there are players that are, are just – overlooked i guess for, for lack of a better way to phrase the question but it's just amazing to me how much talent there is throughout the minor leagues like how many times you were playing through the minors i know you climbed quickly so you might not have as much of a sample size mm -hmm. but you felt like wow there's this guy's way better than people may think or i don't know if the team even knows how good this guy might be do you feel like that happens more often than than we might think or is this a little bit of confirmation bias with two freaks recently coming up yeah, I mean, I, I think it's kind of a two-pronged question, right? The the Latin the way the Latin American system works is just so different, right? So you're you're evaluating kids at 16. I wasn't even probably the best player on my high school team at 16. So mm -hmm. there there's a there's a thing that happens when you you learn how to work out, your body develops, you fill out. What I, you know, even I'm almost 29. I've gained 12 pounds in the past three months, and don't feel like I've really changed when I'm doing that much. I just kind of filled out a little bit. So to evaluate people at 15, 16, 17 years old, yeah, things, things change. Right. And, and, you know, I, I know in the CBA, there's a lot of talk about Latin American draft and things like that. And, you know, I, I think it is interesting I, as the system stands right now, you're going to get these guys that are not paid much and then end up being freaks. And you're going to get a lot of these players that are $4 million, you know, 
16 year olds signing out of Latin America that are going to fizzle out. Not all of them, but certainly some of them, because, you know, there were players at 16 year, 16 years old that are, were incredible. And I remember seeing them like, Oh my, like, I've never seen anything like this. And then you fast forward and they're 22 and they're on a baseball. And, and so, you know, the, the college track kind of, you know, you talk to a scout or for an office, like the floor is kind of established on much, most college guys. And mm-hmm. I think, the system as it lays now, like you're, you're spending money kind of without any floor, right? You're, you're yeah. paying a 16 year old kid. You don't know the floor and you don't know the ceiling. So, uh, you know, Mike Trout was a late first round pick, not an early, you know, just things happen. And, and um, it's kind of interesting. Well, and you're forced into an early decision that is a big financial commitment, right? You see some of these five million, five and a half million dollar international free agents Dylan Cruz is going to get eight, but then you drop to six or seven in this draft. You can still go with a college arm or a college bat, and they're making the same money as the marquee 16 year olds when they're what, five years older than them. They're 21 years old. Right. The other- but also the, yeah. the investment side of the player, right? If, if you're, if you're Dylan, well, say you're Paul Skeens, right? He's right. going to get six million. The, the assumption is that he's going to be making 750 in two years, right? Yeah where these Latin players sign that and then their agent system is drastically different than ours. Um, and that, that kid's probably going to be in the Dominican for two years, the minor leagues for three, and then he's 21 and he got there quick, but that's five years, right? Yeah. So you're, you're kind of, you know, it's just the way that it works now, but it's also drastically different, right? I had a Tommy John and, and was drafted 15 in the big leagues at 17 you know, this schemes kid, the assumption is he'll beat that, right? He's not going to have, you know, he doesn't need Tommy John in the draft like I did. Like, he, he should be in the big leagues quickly and be making life-changing money kind of from the start, especially with this, the increase in the minimum. Yeah. So that brings up an interesting thought that I have with, with college arms. And I know Arm and I have talked about that before. You know, a Reed Detmers drafted in 20, debuting in 21. Mm-hmm. That's a year. How quickly you feel like you can push college arms that seem like they're ready to go? Yeah, I, you know, I think the the scariest recent case study of it is one of my best friends in the world, Carson Fulmer, and and him getting pushed the way that he did. Um, I think in conversations with him, and at least being very close with him, I, I know the White Sox were trying to tweak some stuff that he was doing. Um, I, you know, I think that's a horrible idea. Obviously, the way that it has turned out in terms of how successful Carson is and was and, and could be. Um, the, the thing is that an organization has to be confident enough in their scouting department and confident enough in their player development to kind of hands off certain guys. Um, you know, I remember coming back from my first Tommy John and asking our rehab throwing guy, like my second bullpen, like, what do you got? Like, I like to be coached. I love to be coached. It's one of my, because to me, I'm just looking for the, the same like core principles of how to throw a baseball leverage and this and that. And I want as many ways to describe it as I can, because in certain situations or certain days, maybe one cue works and one doesn't. So I'm trying to amass those cues mm-hmm. and I wanted to be coach. And he was like, listen, man, we drafted you, you know, where we did and you were hurt. Like I'm not touching you. I'm not telling you anything, but it probably let me be, myself when I got there and to kind of own my delivery and own my career. And um, nobody tried to kind of put their thumbprint on me, which, which happens and is kind of sad. So um, I, I think college arms, if you're drafting them in the top five rounds, like, you know, help them improve their strengths and work on their weaknesses. But, you know, they've been coached hard for three years and in a competitive environment, like, they're, they're not the same as a 19-year-old kid that's drafted out of high school who you don't know who's been coaching them, who's had their hands on them, um, and you're kind of drafting them off potential. Like, you've got to build potential. But if you're drafting a kid off his floor, the moment you start tweaking him, that floor can drop. And, and so, for me, it's it's draft the big boy Friday night starter or Saturday starter. Or, shit, I was a Sunday starter. And, you know, let him go be him and see if it works. If it doesn't, fix it. But – until they fail, I, I think it's kind of let them roll. So what's the biggest 
I guess, drawback of, of pushing a college arm or, or any arm for that, for that matter too quickly uh, outside of the, the confidence side of it, if they struggle. Yeah. I, I think that's the biggest one for me, you know, certain programs kind of breed true confidence. And we talked a lot about that in, in college and, and learning your own process, owning it, owning what you do, understanding what you do. And if you go to certain programs and, and I don't want to name any names, but there are certain programs that, that it's about having cool cleats and, and really cool gear. And, and like that, that's just not how you earn that kind of thing. When, when you give up four runs in Clinton, Iowa and low end, like that, <laughs> that shirt is not going to help you. Right. So I think, I think there are certain programs that you can really push guys. And I think there are certain programs that you have to continue to coach them. And, and I think, you know, I think Jack Leiter is a great example. I think Texas is doing some great things because Jack really didn't do very well last year yeah. per his kind of track record. And, and now he's come back. He had an off season. I don't know where he goes. I don't know if he was in Nashville, but wherever he was, it kind of got him back centered and, and he seems to have kind of figured it out a little bit. And awesome. Yeah, he's been great. And I, I think that confidence of what he's doing, he doesn't look any different. It's not like he's doing anything crazy different. It's just the fastball's better. Maybe he got some strength. Maybe he learned, you know, certain things about pro ball versus college and, and whatever. But um, that that's a kid that's confident in what he's doing and and who he is. So, yeah, let him fail and, and let him figure it out on his own. And, and you know what I mean? I just said – maybe let a guy fail once, I, you know, certain programs, certain kids, like you let them fail two, three times. Like you get, gave that kid a lot of money for what he is. Like you can't keep trying to manipulate him into something that he's not. I'm still hung up on the deep cut of the Clinton lumber Kings. That was crazy, dude. <laughs> Nuts. Um, I want to talk about Bobby Miller, your Dodger teammate, who's also rocking tight pants. Shout out Bobby Miller. First of all, the fits have been crazy rolling up to these starts. And I've yeah. seen your quote tweets of it. You love the fits. I love the fits. He's throwing the shit out of the ball right now, man. I mean, another great start in Philly this weekend. Right. What are you seeing from Bobby, dude? You know what's interesting is is in double A, I remember talking to people, what's going on with him? And and his heater wasn't kind of playing the way that you would assume it would. And that was kind of the the weird one. Um I think part of this is scouting, right? We just, in the big leagues, you go very in depth and, and you've got three, well, more than that, but in a meeting, my, my pregame meetings are seven people in there. So you think about all of that kind of data and eye tests and all of that. I think what he's doing is he's tightening the slider a little bit. He's throwing a lot of off-speed. He's very rarely going back-to-back -back heater, which is a big deal, and he's landing stuff. So it's just hard. It's hard to hit. He's throwing really hard. Everything's sharp. Everything has cor the correct action to it, and he's just a big, strong boy. But I think what's happened is he's making – I wonder if we ran the numbers on runners in scoring position kind of pitch quality – like where that would be compared to runners on. And he's doing a great job of keeping guys off base, but he, he's seemingly really, really pitching and really, really throwing to spots with runners on. And that's a, that's a tough thing to do to kind of switch back and forth. I, I don't think he's trying to do that, but I think it's a really big indicator of, of success in that he has kind of a second gear and, and that gear is not necessarily try and throw this ball harder. It's, it's command it. And that, that's a tough thing to do. And, and something I feel like in, in certain points of my career, I've been able to do really well. And, and some points I have it um, just so happens his first four starts of his career, he's done it, you know, extremely well. Um, so, you know, I think, I think everyone's excited. I'm, I'm certainly excited. So his fastball is averaged 99 miles an hour. And <laughs> you talked about just, just now how, wasn't playing up at points the way you would expect a near triple digits and triple digits fastball to play up. Something that stands out to me is you look at the end zone whiff in his four big league starts on the fastball. It's, it's only 7%, but mm -hmm. he's pounding the strike zone, hitting his spots with it. And again, it sets up kind of the secondary stuff. How much do you, and maybe it's different pitcher to pitcher, 
but how much are you looking at the end zone whiff of a, of a fastball? Because obviously that's indicative of quality versus maybe how that sets up the rest of your arsenal when, similar to you, this is a guy that has an assortment of quality secondaries that he can get you out with. Yeah, I, I think for me it was never a super important thing because, number one, the swing and miss I wanted was at the top, and the assumption mm-hmm. is that that's on a strike. Yeah. And I also knew – my best fastballs were down away. And when my fastball is good, it's getting taken. Uh, so whiff rate, it, like I don't necessarily always want people to swing on my fastball. Fair. I mean, late in counts, right? But I, I'm a big, I've always been a guy that's oh, oh down away and I want it taken and I want it a strike. Like that's kind of how I navigate at bats the best. And uh, so I, I don't know if my whiff rate has ever been great on my fastball i I think or in zone at least maybe in general um just because you know early in my career was down way down way and i'd shoot balls up and also you know i know it's not that long ago but it was a little bit different in 2018 than it than it is now there's not guys that just back then it wasn't uh every fastball you threw at the top and there's guys that are doing that now and so it's kind of muddied the waters on on that kind of stuff. But, you know, when I came up, it was still fastballs down in the zone early, up late. Um, we were kind of figuring out some relievers needed to stay up there. But now it's almost like every reliever is only trying to throw fastballs at the top half. And and so hitters see that a lot. It, it's just a different – it's a different thing now. Game changes quickly. Like, I think that's yeah. something that we've talked about before. And, and I guess – you know, shit, man, we're 25 years old. Like the game has changed a couple times in our time of viewing baseball. Like that's how quickly it changes. Yeah. Um, speaking of the runners and scoring position thing, uh, Bobby's been excellent. Obviously he's been excellent the whole time. Base is empty. Opponents are hitting a buck 67. They're four for 32 against him with runners on and in scoring position, they're one for 13. So he's been excellent. He seems confident as hell. And yeah. like, that's the vibe that you got if you watched him at Louisville. I got that vibe when I watched him in the minor leagues. How confident is this guy on the hill? Um, I think there's there's the cocky thing and there's the confident thing, right? And honestly, that I haven't seen many people work at the same level as him. Just he's pretty meticulous. I don't think um, I don't know how to say this. I, I think he's a lot more intelligent than than people kind of would give him credit for in terms of here's what I need to do. Here's the plan. I'm not going to miss anything. Um, he listens really, really well. We went to dinner with, with him and his girlfriend for his dinner and we were just talking and he just kind of absorbed it on, on a night that, you know, I want the guy to have three or four glasses of wine and hang out and have fun and, and enjoy it. Right. And, and if he gets a little reckless, fine, it's his birthday. And, and he wasn't like that at all. And, and it kind of changed, uh, you know, that's how I am and would be you know what I mean but um it he's just not he's not exactly the way he comes off and he's really um confident in in the work I think more than anything and and kind of understands that he's talented and um but there's talented and there's working hard and and I think he's kind of found that ground of of working really hard and being confident out of that as opposed to being confident because I'm talented it's so cool to me for like the the generational uh, advice that can be kind of handed down because I look at the team as it's constructed right now. It, yeah. You learned so much, I'm sure, as you've talked about a little bit with, from Clayton Kershaw, who's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. And, and now what is it like for you to be in a position where it probably feels like you still just got to the big leagues, even though you've had so much success there, where you can be someone that now helps a Bobby Miller, one of the best pitching prospects is looking to you to, to pick your brain. What is that like in this almost a ladder of, of advice that can be shared? And also real quick, might I point out noted good guy, Walker Bueller taking Bobby Miller out to dinner on his birthday. Yeah. So like, <laughs> there we go. There's that mentor thing going on there. Oh, gee. No, I, you know, plenty <laughs> of people did that shit for me. So uh, no, I, I think it's interesting because I think what's funny about that is probably the basis of Kirsch's and I's, Kirsch and I's relationship is that I looked at things very different and very much let him, not let him, it's Clayton Kirk, but we had discussions about like how he went about it. And then as time went on, it just kind of seeped that some of the new age stuff kind of seeped into conversations. And 
I was kind of ready for those conversations. And so I think that's kind of the basis of whatever respect he and I have in our relationship. Right. And what I don't want to do is ever take a young kid that knows what they, who they are and what they're doing and try and change them. But there's certain things that, you know, I think a lot of it comes out of just my size and what I feel like I needed to do to be successful was outsmart people more than, than other people. But I never wanted, I I never thought of myself as like, Oh, I know what to throw in every count and I set you up and do all this. I, I think for me, it was always really understanding what, how to train my body to do what I wanted it to do and my delivery and things like that. So and then on top of that, I, I kind of have this understanding of pitch characteristics and why what why what I do works for me, why it wouldn't work for someone else. And I think um, being able to kind of share that is, has been one of the cooler parts of my career. Uh, even in rehab, we, you know, Ryan Brazier has been been here with us for a little while and wants to figure out a cutter. And it's like the first day I talked to him, I was like, how do you throw your fastball? And his wrist is in a similar position. It's like you need to be throwing my cu- the, the same cutter that I throw because you're you're releasing the ball the same way and uh, you know I think it's gonna be really good for him it's just, like that stuff is as cool as anything to me I love that I love that bullpen type conversation where like you can pick up on other yeah. stuff from guys in your staff and my favorite example of that was when Yavaldi found a different gear in New York because Tanaka taught him that split. Yep. And like all of a sudden he takes off because Tanaka helpful teammate, like that's yep. transcending what Tanaka can do on the mound. Cause he's helping somebody else. And now 40% of their starts have a great splitter instead of doesn't up. show up in the F war there, unfortunately. No, no, <laughs> no but that, that's kind of the, the sad part of the, of the game now, right. Is that that clubhouse guy is kind of being undervalued. You know, I, I think, um, not that I'm the greatest clubhouse guy. I can be really abrasive and arrogant and whatever, but like I was 182 pounds for the first five years of my career and, and somehow was throwing the ball really hard and, and had success and was good in the playoffs. And, and I checked some box through 200 innings. Like I did some things that, that somebody that looks like me probably shouldn't be able to do. Um, and th- there's something there, but there, you know, there's also a reason that Clayton can throw, certain pitches that nobody else in baseball has ever thrown his slider. No one has ever really thrown that pitch. Um, So trying to learn kind of that outlier stuff from him. Yeah. He can tell me he thinks that he does it this way, but like, is my arm slot in the right spot? Do I hold a ball the similar way? Is my wrist position anywhere close? Like then you can shuffle out. Like I'll never do that. Or I think I can figure out how to do exactly this. And uh, Rich Hill was big in that with, with curveball with me, um, certain feelings that, that he created. Uh, even, I'll tell you one of the weirdest stories ever. My first day in the major leagues, uh, I got called up September, whatever, 6th. And you Darvish walked straight up to me, asked me about my Tommy John in perfect English. Don't let him fool you guys. <laughs> he was like, hey, my, my hard curveballs is fine after my Tommy John, my slow one's fine, but the medium one's not very good. He was like, how do you, how are you throwing, how does your curveball feel? Huh. But like, that's the thing, right? It's like, I had no business telling you Darvish how to do anything, right? Like yeah. this guy made a hundred million dollars and you know, he's now he's won a hundred games in the big leagues after his career in Japan. Like, and it's just, this guy does this well. Can I go and pick something from him? regardless of, you know, that that's what he's thinking, right? It, he's got a good curveball. Can I pick anything from him? He had Tommy John, good curveball. I don't care what he's done. And, and so that's that's kind of the beauty of, of our game. And and it's kind of a it was, like for me, that was the coolest moment ever. I was like, number one, why are you asking me this? <laughs> number two, like, I'll try and explain as best I can. Number three, like, go win for us. Like, I'll be <laughs> sitting in the <laughs> Go get him, champ. Um, yeah. yeah, I totally. Wow, that's really cool. And Darvish, I is he the first guy to sign three six year deals? Obviously, he opted out of one, but that's just a crazy yeah. feat to accomplish. Maybe A Rod had something similar, I think. 
Yeah, he was on that. There's something with a round where he signed two of something or three of something that nobody else had. Yeah, but Darvish just signed his third six-year deal, man. Real yeah. quick before we move on to curveballs, um, Jacob deGrom, it was announced last week, he's undergoing his second. Tommy John just mentioned Yavaldi real quick. You said he was kind of like, you know, the gold standard of guys that ha- have undergone two TJs you're rehabbing yeah. from your second. I'm not sure if you've communicated with deGrom at all. Um, he, he, like, what would your message be to a guy like that who, who's set to go yeah. through that? And obviously, we saw raw emotion from him. Yeah, that was, that was yeah, tough. I don't, that, it's hard. It, you know, I met him at the altar game and stuff a few times. And, and I think the, the big thing is like, he didn't start pitching until so late in his life. What, what's so wild, like, my Tommy John lasted six, six, seven years. Like, his first one, I think, lasted 13, someone was saying the other day. So, it, it's hard for me and on some thing because like this guy's had an unbelievable career on, on a reconstructed ligament. Right. And so for me, it's like, what is he doing that, that I didn't do the first time that mine lasted half the time of his also, like, I think a lot of that emotion. And, and I think every interaction I've had with him, it, it seems like an extremely genuine human is that like, I don't think he's really upset for himself. I think he's mad because he feels like their team has a real chance to do something special this year. Um, you know, I got hurt and and we have a great team and my emotion was like, all right, I got to do something for a year, but like, fuck, I won't get to pitch in the playoffs. Like that, that's where the emotion comes from. And, and it seems like that's uh, where it comes from, from him and, and my buddies to play over there. Everyone has nothing but good things to say about him. So, um, you know, that, that's my assumption, you know, some guys can can get emotional like that and come off extremely selfish. And, and I, I didn't take it that way, but it's always kind of lingering out there in that like, oh, well, he doesn't get his and, and then other – well, he's already made X amount of money and there's all these kind of nasty hypotheticals that you can come up with, but I don't think it was that. And, uh, you know, I think – the big thing for him is like whatever you did the first time, man, like you obviously did a pretty good job, like go and get strong and, and figure it out. But, you know, I, I think watching him pitch is some sort of gold standard for, for right-handed starting pitchers now. And, you know, we're talking about Ellie De, De La Cruz and how easy he makes really hard things look. And I think he's kind of the gold standard for that in terms of, of pitching, right? looks like he's just kind of standing and throwing and it's 99 and, it's really commanded and he does, he checks every box. And, uh, you know, I think in some way him getting a year off is, is kind of a, a blessing in disguise. I think you have to find something, but he's dealt with the shoulder and then the forearm strains and all this. And, you know, him not pitching until he was a certain age, like we all talk about his age and can he get in the hall of fame? And he's obviously been one of the most dominant guys ever when he's been on the mound, but maybe this year off means he gets a shoulder in a better spot and his elbow stronger. And maybe he can pitch like Verlander until he's 42. And cause I think he can be very successful at 94, 95. It doesn't have to be a hundred, um, especially given the experience that he has now. So um, maybe he can play till he's 44 now. 43 now if this thing lasts another six seven years yeah so you know I, I obviously none of us want him to be hurt or anybody to be hurt but um it seems like he's had a couple years where there's something going on every year and and maybe we can fix all that up and, and fix that elbow and, and get him for a long time 